Tired of not finding the code you're looking for? Get SourceGraph Universal Code Search and search code across your entire code base. That's all your repos, languages, and code hosts. Find and fix bugs? Do better code reviews. Identify security risks. Onboard to a new code base and make large-scale refactors. With SourceGraph, you can find anything in code fast without losing your flow. SourceGraph Universal Code Search is a developer's superpower. Try it now at info.sourcegraph.com slash Hanselminutes. That's info.sourcegraph.com slash Hanselminutes. I'm Scott Hanselman, and it's another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today, I'm chatting with Dr. Divya Dar Cohen. She works at Google, and she is also a medical doctor. And I'm looking at your LinkedIn here, and you have collected not only a bunch of degrees, but a bunch of wonderful experiences that bridge both the medical world and the technology world. Welcome. Thank you, Scott. Super excited to be here and uh, chat with you today. Yeah. So you are a uh, an MD. You have a uh, an MBCHB, which is the degree that you get in in New Zealand uh, in medicine and surgery. And you did you did in fact practice medicine for a number of years, right? Yes, I did for about a year to two years, and mm -hmm. yeah, it was one of the most I uh, think fulfilling p times of my life. Super beautiful. But then you you're now at Google, and you're a product uh, you know a product manager. I, I, I mentioned this to my wife and she's like, you're only supposed to pick one thing, right? You're only allowed to be one thing. Didn't you have to decide when you were 18 that you would be a doctor and that was it for the rest of your life? Yeah, exactly. At 18, we had to make that choice. Uh, in New Zealand, when you uh, go into med school, it's usually around 18. Some people do do it after grad school, but most people do it after un straight away uh, as part of the undergrad. So I kind of joke with people, I never got an undergraduate degree, even though I've done nine years of graduate schooling. Um, but yeah, exactly. I find that pretty crazy that that's the requirements that the world has on people at age 18 to make their decision for the rest of their life when most of us at age 18 have never done any real jobs other than like, for my case, paper runs. And I was a deli assistant. And <laughs> like, I used to work in the shoe warehouse and sell shoes, all of those jobs, but I never picked a job where I was like, actually doing the job. So yeah, it was basically like, hoping for the best when I made that call. Yeah, like we're not qualified as young people to decide what we're going to do for the rest of our lives, nor should we be forced to. So why not, uh, you know, bridge into other under other things? There's no reason that we have to pick a niche and stick with it. Yeah, exactly. And I love the concept that we've now got around internships. But I feel like a lot of people's internships happen while they're in undergrad, which is awesome. But if you're having to make decisions for the rest of your life before you've done any internships, that's really, really hard. So, you know, maybe um, there's going to be some pre undergrad internships or like adult internships, so you can start to make those more informed decisions. Mm -hmm. Was it a passion for learning or why did you go back and get a master of public administration and then go back and get an MBA? Is it just, I want to collect the knowledge? Honestly, I wanted to make a really like global impact. So in New Zealand, while I was practicing as a doctor, I had started a nonprofit and that nonprofit's called P3 Foundation ended up doing really well. We, our goal was to inspire young people to end extreme poverty. And, um, you know, we got, um, we did some really interesting campaigns that made good impact on the world, uh, uh, like Pay Fair Trade Forward was one of them, where we asked people to buy the first fair trade coffee from a cafe and then instead of drinking it themselves, pass it on to the next person. And uh, that got onto national news because it was just really interesting. And well, it was like a cool human story because only 50% of these chains ended before the day ended. And it was a good way to get people thinking about what is fair trade coffee and how do you think about using everyday economics to help improve the lives of those uh, that are living on less than a dollar a day. But anyway, so these kind of campaigns got re got me really excited and the kind of impact we were making. And I was asking myself the question, how do I do this on a global scale? Because um, this nonprofit was for young people making an impact globally, but from New Zealand. So I wanted to understand what does it take to build a global um, organization? And for that, um, I decided to come and do the MBA-MPA combination that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the things that I find particularly fun about your your LinkedIn as you're building this knowledge base of things that you can do to make a global impact is one of these things doesn't quite match the others. I see Wharton Business School, MBA, University of Auckland, and then it says Coding Dojo, three-month coding boot camp where you just, like, did you get to a point where it's like they're talking about code and I'm not following, so I'm going to get up to speed? What made you decide in the middle of 2016 to go and do a boot camp? I'm a really big believer in empathy. And uh, I think if you're going to be a leader in anything, you need to really like understand the people you're working with. And I knew I was going to be a leader in the space of tech, especially health tech. And I obviously had you know, done the training and tried to understand from a medical perspective, um, the people that I'm working with there. But I didn't know very well the way that um, my the people I work with now, my the engineers and UX designers, how do they work? And I felt like if I'm going to dedicate my career to this, I need to spend the time to actually understand the problems that people run into. And that's why I ended up doing this three-month full-time coding boot camp. Not because I wanted to be an engineer myself, but I wanted to make sure that I could empathize. And I did. I One of the things I loved about engineering was it was super logical. And that's some a part of me that I love. I love that, like the analytical part, the logical part. But I can also empathize when engineers are like, the debugging process is so annoying and frustrating. And I was just like, hats off to engineers who have to do that daily. Um, and that's one of the main reasons I couldn't do it long term. I was like, oh my God, this will drive me insane. But at least now I empathize with it and I know why it can be so frustrating. Um, my wife is a is a medical surgical nurse, and we liken the debugging process that I use as a computer engineer to the kind of differential diagnosis process that she goes through to try to figure out the mystery. And it's never quite like an episode of the House TV show where you just kind of like th- magically know what the problem is, and it's like, oh, it's a, it's obscure fungus. They ate a mushroom or whatever. It's like, no, it's really a process. The debugging process is a, a binary search. It's this or it's this, and it's this or it's this. Oh, I agree. And I think that's why when people are like, what's happening with COVID? Why do they keep changing their minds? I'm like, they're just learning new information. That is literally what's happening. And as new information comes, of course, you're going to go down a different pathway uh, because no one is God and no one can just like have the first answer without knowing more information. So yeah, totally agree with that. It definitely feels like the world right now in the middle of the pandemic is learning about the scientific method and controls and variables. And uh, it doesn't seem like everyone was really up to speed on that as we see a lot of confusion about that process. Yeah. You know, one of the best things I think that's come out of COVID is health literacy has gone up drastically amongst everyone, like how much people are learning and investigating about the immune immune process, about their own um, capacity for generating like immunity. I just find that so cool. Like, I just think that's amazing. But at the same time, you know, there's been some massive conspiracy theories around this. And I think that's also very telling of how much more work is required to provide good science communication to people. Um, So there's a lot to be done, but also a lot to be celebrated. It, it seems like in your career that health literacy has been a really important thing, not just you know, bringing health and insights, meaningful insights, not just to the clinic, uh, but also to the people through through measurement of, of data, through democratization of, of data. Oh, yes, absolutely. I think um, one of the best things you can do for yourself is to empower yourself. And one of the things that um, I think I used to think really interesting around medicine was uh, it tended to be very patriarchal. And I think the new generation doesn't respond very well to that. And the new generation requires you to be more like a coach. And and to be a good coach, you actually have to let people get access to their own data and see for themselves how changing behaviors, changing their actions actually impact their own data. And I think that's kind of the direction I would like to see us go and move into because it's way more empowering and uh, will produce much stronger results. Mm-hmm. One of the companies that you worked at was is called Cardiogram, and I was pleased to see that even though this was a, quite a few years ago, maybe four years ago that you worked there, that's actually an app that I have on my home screen, and that was a total coincidence that you worked there and I was a fan of the app, and uh, one of the things that makes me happy about it is that it is kind of passively collecting data you know, with permission that I can I have control of. And uh, it gives me insights. And I was actually able to notice in just glancing at the trend line here that my resting heart rate has considerably dropped as I've been 
actively working out. And you can literally see I made a decision at the end of September to really start working out in earnest. And I hadn't thought about my resting heart rate. And you can literally see on the graph that it is it is happening. And I discovered that just before I, you know, this interview. And I have to say, it makes me feel very kind of like powerful and like, I want to get it even lower now. Oh, exactly. And yeah, I did. I loved working at Cardiogram. It's such an amazing company and great founding team. Um, but yeah, like one of the things I loved about that is because it's built, they've built an amazing, strong community and it's a community based around giving people their data so that they can make these decisions for themselves. And you're right. One of the things I loved also was the fact that you get this you know, inkling about resting heart rate and other metrics, but I personally found resting heart rate the most interesting one because it's highly highly correlated with your overall health status. So um, in medicine, we were always taught like there's a normal zone of your heart rate. And if you go below that normal zone, you're abnormal, except if you're an athlete. And in which case, having a lower uh, heart rate below the normal zone is actually still co- considered normal. So um, it's very fascinating when you can drive that down and you're now in that category. So uh, yeah, hopefully you'll get to do that too, Scott. My my brother uh, ha- is, an um, he's not an athlete, he's a firefighter, but he does like Ironman and triathlons and stuff like that. And he his resting heart rate is 55, sometimes 53. And it's kind of ridiculous because you check his heart rate and it's just like, gagung. It's like, oh, are you even alive? Ridiculous. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and when you compare that to a baby's, which is like way, way faster than an average human, yeah. um, <laughs> um, adult human. Yeah, it's like so vastly different. So yes. yeah, very exciting. I have a baby. I have a baby's heart rate right, right now, but I'm working on it. And, that, <laughs> and what's exciting about it is those those that continuous monitoring is so important. And you mentioned a moment ago about coaching, about a doctor as a coach. People are afraid to go to the doctor. People are. I've talked to people. A friend of mine, actually from down under from Australia, hasn't been to the doctor in seven years, and I asked him why not. It's because they might find something. That seems like the wrong way to go about it. I go to the doctor all the time. Every three months, I think of it as like a, a therapy session or a coaching session. I want to know: Am I on the right track? Get my blood work. Show them. Show them my data, and then live longer. That's my relationship with my doctor. You know, and that's what I hope other people's relationship becomes not just with their daughter doctor, but with the health system in general. I think people are so scared of it. And in some ways we actually inhibit it because of the massive costs, right? Out of pocket costs. Not only out of pocket costs, at least if it was out of pocket pocket costs and you knew exactly what you were paying, maybe that's okay. But the fact is that they are so obfuscated and you don't know what's going on. So you're scared of the financial repercussions. And then on top of that, you're scared of the, you know, the actual health repercussions. And and then the third thing is like, even though medicine started off being the kind of profession that was um, supposed to be a doctor who's helping you with your well-being, you know, because of the times that they've had to cut down to increase productivity, the time they spend on any particular patient, mm-hmm. essentially they all they're doing is at this point disease management as opposed to prevention and well-being. So I love the fact that you've created this kind of therapeutic relationship with your doctor, but I can also see why it's so hard for most people to do that. Um, the, a lot of the system is kind of against it right now. And you kind of have to take the stance you took, which is like be very forthright and make it happen for yourself. Yeah, I totally agree that like even though I'm I'm going every three months, um, it's still a ten minute you know interaction, a fifteen minute interaction. And, uh, I I'm very concerned about wasting his time. It's clear that he's running past fifteen, twenty different people that he has to see all in one day. So I'm I'm certainly very privileged in the way that I can see him every quarter. But I'd love to have an hour, like an hour with a doctor. That would be an unreal experience. What an amazing thing. We could do a whole health checkup and I would live longer for it. Yeah. And uh, hopefully they do do that with your physical checks. I think that was the original intent of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so there, those are supposed to be longer. You're supposed to do a systems history where you go through each system and talk about that. Um, but even that, right, most people still don't do their physical checks. And I think it's like pretty small. It's like, under 50% of people who's, who yeah. actually go and get their physical checks done, even though, even in America, that's like a free checkup that you get as part of your health insurance. Right. And that just kind of perpetuates that that uh, that awkward relationship with your doctor, but also an, oct- an awkward relationship with your own body. 
mm-hmm. and with your own data. Like I like knowing about my resting heart rate. I like the the Apple Watch or the Fitbit giving me that data. And then as a diabetic, I have an additional metric and I have an open source database filled with my blood sugar. I've got you know, 10, 15 years of every five minutes, my blood sugar going back. So I could run data science on my own, on my own body. But it's also unfair because I'm a programmer, right? Why mm-hmm. can't my non-technical spouse have those same insights mm-hmm. and trend lines and things like that? Yeah, so you're really like capitalizing on all the latest and quantified self. So I really like that you're doing that. But I agree, it's like still quite a way away for the average person to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But also not just that. I think um, it also hasn't caught on, honestly, in the medical system. Like most doctors don't have time to review anything unless it's abnormal. And that's what I mean. That's coming back to like, how are you thinking about your doctor? It's partly mm-hmm. because if they're not, if their only time they inter- interact with you is when something's wrong or something's abnormal, you're going to have this like weird relationship with them versus like, hey, Scott, I noticed your resting heart rate went down. Congratulations. You know, I feel like we need to build a system which does both, right? So mm-hmm. there's like a much more of a therapeutic relationship. Um, but yeah, I think those are one of the things that I would like to see more of. Well, and that's one of the things that you and your career have really focused on is the synthesis of different kind of diverse silos. Like you, you said, all right, I got the, I got the PhD. I'm a doctor. I mean, I got the MD. I'm a doctor. And now I'm going to learn about tech. So you're consciously breaking out of a niche. Are you doing that in order to synthesize between the two? Are you trying to build bridges between these different disciplines? Yeah, from the very early age, um, there, you know, I think we all have one thing. If you really think about it, I don't know about you, but I've spent a lot of time reflecting. What's the one thing that my heart says on repeat about me? Why did I come on this, come to this planet? And literally for me, it's always the same thing. I came here to build. I came here to build, like literally says that over and over again, no matter what I do. And to me, building for me means something new that's never been done before. That's literally what it says all the time. So because of that, I felt like, okay, if I want to build something new that's never been built before, what's the best way to do that? And for me, the answer was, and I actually like did a lot of research to figure out how do previous innovators, how do they come up with their ideas? And one of the strongest ways to do that is to understand Two, very, two, ideally even three, very different silos in depth. Like you actually have to go deep on at least two, if not three different areas. And then if you do that, you'll be able to cr- start to cross see between like how things are um, similar and how things are different and basically use that to come up with like points of innovation. So I, all, even though it looks really crazy, my like life story right now, I really feel like I'm almost at the verge where they're going to start to combine because I spent the first like decade or two trying to make sure that I understand each area really well in depth. And I think the next like decade is going to come where I'm going to start to combine them all. This portion of Hansel Minutes is brought to you by Datadog. Do you have an app in production that is slower than you like? Is its performance all over the place? Sometimes it's slow, sometimes fast. With Datadog, you can troubleshoot your app performance with end-to-end tracing. Use detailed flame graphs from real requests to help you identify bottlenecks and latency. Seamlessly navigate to related logs and metrics without switching tools for full context leading to faster MTTR. That's mean time to repair. Get started today at datadoghq.com slash Hansel Minutes. That's datadoghq.com slash Hansel Minutes. One of the things that I like to at least attempt to practice is deliberate practice and applying intentionality into my life and my lifestyle. The idea being that I don't want to accept the defaults. And if you simply get up, live, and go to sleep, then that was a default day. It just kind of happened. But if you stop for a second, be mindful. Is this what I need to be doing right now? Is this what I want to be doing right now? Is this what I should be doing right now? That intentionality slows down time, makes you feel like you have a little bit more uh, time, and it also focuses you on what the next step is. And I get that vibe from you and from your your writings and the things that you're choosing to work on. Oh, absolutely. I I 100% agree that. um, And I really like that what you, how you describe that as well. Yeah, for me, it's like, um, I think I ask that question almost to a detriment sometimes, but I think it's a, a really important question. Like, 
Why am I here? What am I doing? Is this, is this the best way to be creating impact with the unique skills that I have? And I believe everyone has really unique skills and we all have ways that we can contribute to the world. So if you have, have, if you can A, recognize that about yourself and just accept it, because a lot of people are scared of their own like brilliance in some ways or their own brightness as that quote is, I don't know that exact quote, but it really resonates with me. I think a lot of us are scared of our own like, like uniqueness and, uh, and we're too scared of showing ourselves because we might look like a weird person, but actually it's the weirdness in you that makes you like have the potential to make an impact. So I think the last few years I've really tried to embrace that about myself and just accept that, look, my story may not, may not have a connection for others. It might seem super weird, but at the same time, if it m- is meaningful for me, that's all that matters. And as long as I know where this path is eventually taking me, even though I don't have it fully planned out, but I have some intentionality for why I'm doing what I'm doing. And that's kind of all that matters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. that It's hard to, the idea of being afraid of your own brilliance is uh, no one wants to be egotistical and no one wants to like talk too much about themselves. But at the same time, it's good to have a healthy amount of like, I'm good at this, you know, and that's okay. Yeah, I am and good at this, and it's okay to be good at it. Yeah. Even if you're not good at it yet, right? It doesn't take that much time. I know people don't, I, I mean, I used to think like, oh my God, I have to spend like 20 years doing something. Actually, if you get work really, really hard and focus on something, I promise you within six months, you're going to be in the top 50th percentile. And within a year, you're going to be in the top 90th percentile. And within three years or two to three years, you're going to be in like the top 95th percentile in that area. And you just keep going, you're suddenly in the top 99.99% percentile. So it doesn't take that much effort to get really good at something. And I think that's what people sometimes don't understand because most of our heroes tend to be heroes that you know, have already done that work. They've done the five, 10 years and they're at their peak. And we are like, oh my God, it took them 10 years or five years, whatever, however long. But mm-hmm. actually like those, the, you'll start to see awards pretty soon, right? Like within six months, you're going to start to see some re- rewards. And that's probably what happened with them too. And they were like, oh, look at me. I'm like moving ahead in this. And then they were like, let me spend another six months on it. And then another year. And slowly mm-hmm. they're getting better and better at their craft. And yeah, I personally think like, you like I personally love um, becoming excellent at something and and that's fun to me that's like a really fun journey and and why not like why not try to be good at what mm-hmm. you do yeah um, it was Marianne uh, Marianne Williamson who said that our deepest fear is not that we're inaccurate inadequate rather our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate that is we are powerful beyond measure that idea of being afraid of your own brilliance yes. and um, the idea that you're saying that small incremental intentional change adds up with a callback all the way to the beginning of the conversation where I said my resting heart rate's gone down, mm. a small thing. It was done intentionally though, because you can actually see in September at the end, my wife and I decided to close our Apple watch rings. Mm. We got tired of looking at the activity thing and it was very, you know, we weren't doing our 10,000 steps as they say. And yes. you can see a direct correlation between us getting off our butts and the heart rate going down. And now that I've noticed it, I have registered it. I'm going to see what I can do with that in my life. And I'm like, well, maybe I actually could be not athletic, but you know, f- at least somewhat fit. And that is oh, a powerful yeah. thing. It is a powerful thing. And actually, um, recently, I've been trying to collect stories of people who start things like later in their life. And I, when I say later, it could be anywhere from like 30s onwards. Mm-hmm. And and it's amazing to me that when you look into that, there are so many people who start something later and they are great at it, right? Like yeah. um, actors who, that have become get an Oscar at 70 or something like yes, that. Yes, it's so beautiful. And and anyway, so I, I love that, Scott. So I, one of the things is uh, one of the things I, I think I'm concurring with you is like how important it is to continue to learn. And if you find new passions, go after them. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things that's a great example of that is when you decided after doing all these different things and all the different diverse uh, experiences and uh, side side hustles, as we say here in the U.S. that you do, you said, I want to go get a job at Google. So then you've got this wonderful article called How to Prepare for Google's Product Management Technical Round When You're Not Technical. Mm-hmm. And what's significant about it is it is extremely intentional. There's an mm-hmm. acknowledgement that you have master's degrees, but not in engineering, mm-hmm. but you are logical. 
you are powerful. And you went through step-by-step -step fundamentals of computer science, fundamentals of programming. And it looks like it probably was a couple of months, several months of focused, intentional uh, studying in order to, to, to interview successfully at Google. Uh, yes, I was actually super surprised how much time it took. Um, but I'm really glad I did that. But <laughs> yeah, I, I honestly I think like when you go through mid school, you're like, nothing can be that hard, right? You get you get a little <laughs> bit like um, arrogant, or at least I think I did. And as like, actually, engineering is equally as hard, if not as hard, if not harder, uh, at least mm -hmm. I can concur that now. And um, one of the things I did want to do is if I want to make tech one of the things that I'm you know, practicing in and being a leader. And I want to make sure that I understand it really well. So I didn't use Google interview as a way to just get in. Like, I thought that was like really silly. What right, I it's not to a do game was, to play. It's not right. a game to play. What yeah. I wanted to do was like, I want to be a leader in this field. And that means actually understanding it like through and through. So that's why, you know, I did the Coding Dojo Bootcamp for three months, which I don't think people actually need to do. But that two months of full-time study that I did on actually the fundamentals, that I actually do think is really important. And understanding system design is super important, uh, especially as a product manager. So for me, it was like, I'm going to dedicate this time because it's going to impact the rest of my life. It's going to impact the teams that I'm working for and with, and it's worth it's worth it for me because I'm sure it's going to be worth it for them that I, they don't end up with like a product manager that doesn't know what they're talking about and then mm -hmm. they get frustrated. So I was really using them as my motivation. Like I was like, I want to be a good team player here. Yeah. And what's what's significant about it is that it is no different in my perspective than than me or someone uh, writing down the exercises that we're going to do, or I am going to eat better right now. You sit down, you make a decision, but it's not a dramatic one. You're not going to drop everything and work out five days a week. You know, you can't study this eight, 10 hours a day, but even an hour, even two hours, okay, you know, it adds up. I, someone told me that if you did something 30 minutes a day, then that's like a hundred and something hours, 150, 160 hours a year. It's a huge amount of time. If you can just find that 30 minutes to read a book, a nonfiction book, um, it feels like a small upfront investment, but over time, that trend line has got to go in the direction you want it to go. Yeah, and especially if you're reading books that are changing your perspectives in life and hence mm -hmm. changing your actions, like every 1% change, you know, by the end of the year, if you do it per day, um, you're like 37%, 37 times evolved as a human. And I'm just like, that is that should be really our goal. Like we don't understand how small things compound so quickly over time. I was... Just going to say, it's the power of compounding interest. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. And I know that everyone here, when they were 12 or 13, they learned all about compounding interest and how you know this person started investing at this age and this person invested 10 years later and they can never catch up mm -hmm. because of the power. You know, it's like, I should have been working out earlier than this. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I would have been quite fit, but I'm still going to try to catch up. And that's, that's a good work. Yeah. And, and honestly, at the end of the day, it's just starting whenever you start anything, it already makes an impact, right? Even in health, if you stop working out within two weeks, you're going to see a massive reduction in your like muscle weight. And if you start working out, it's going to slowly come back. But it, it shocks me how, again, like we get so disheartened by like, actually these small, small changes make such a huge difference to our life. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing that I think is worth pointing out, just because it's fun as we get towards the end of our, our wonderful chat here, is uh, while you were in the middle of a, co a COVID shelter in place, uh, you went through a virtual wedding. Is that true? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it was a, uh, I don't think anyone probably, I don't know if anyone did, but I definitely never imagined that I was going to get married virtually <laughs> uh, without my family or without my um, husband's family being present. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we kicked it off. And the other crazy thing is we all, we organized the whole thing like three days, uh, which was also crazy. It was just like, um, just the way it happened. Like we had to do it during the first lockdown where things just people just didn't know what to do and you couldn't mm -hmm. even get a marriage license, let alone get married. So we had to find a county willing to give us a marriage license. And by the time they informed us of our date, we only had three days to let people know. So anyway, mm -hmm. people were getting messages from us like the day of the wedding, like, hey, the wedding's in two hours. Hopefully you can show up. And uh, it was it was exhilarating and fun, but also in the same time, one of the best days of both of our lives. So I think I can say with whole 
earnestly that you do not need to spend a lot of money to have a beautiful day for your wedding. <laughs> I'm going to make sure to include a link in the show notes because uh, it is a Google Meet and you can see all the different faces from all over, but everyone is smiling, including you and your uh, new husband. Uh, so it certainly looks like it was fun if it was not the wedding that you expected. Definitely, definitely the wedding of our dreams. <laughs> That's great. I will give you a tip as someone, an unsolicited tip as someone who's been married for 20 years, get married as much as you can. My <laughs> wife has gotten married basically every five years for the last 20 years because people only get together for weddings and funerals mm. and funerals are no fun. So if you just throw another wedding in five years and then maybe another one in five years, we did our 15 year vow renewal and everyone flew in and it was great. And again, it doesn't have to be expensive, but it's an excuse to get everyone to come back and hang out with you again. Oh, this is a great idea. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Might take you up on that. Yeah, absolutely. I'll send you the pictures and you can see how it looked. But uh, the, 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 the funny part was that she ended up wearing the exact same dress. But I, uh, as we know, I've only recently started working out in earnest, was not able to wear the same tuxedo, unfortunately. Oh, my gosh. She's giving me uh, major like life goals. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully I'll get to wear my same dress. Uh, the other thing that I would be remiss to mention if I if I let you go without uh, talking about it was that you're on TikTok and uh, you know a lot of there's a lot of young people on TikTok and I would I would have to say that you're you're not 19. Yes. Uh, have you have you found TikTok to be a welcoming place as as a person who isn't 19? Oh, absolutely! I love I love work. I love using TikTok. I feel like it's one of the most creative social platforms. Um, mm -hmm. I think. I think most of us will find one or two social platforms that jive with our personality. And I have mm -hmm. to say, I think TikTok jives with my personality the most because it tends to promote people who are the most creative. Mm. Um, and I know there's like issues with that too. Like, you know, it's, it's not always, uh, I guess, the fair or however people say it. But at the same time, in the overall, the, the things that I do get to see are super creative and exciting. Uh, and it's fun. I basically have used it as a way to be creative, let off some steam and enjoy, have some fun, but also share some messages that I think I wish I had learned earlier that I think could be helpful to other people. Um, so it's been an amazing platform and I definitely hope to continue using it. Well, I'm having a blast on TikTok. Um, uh, I am going to have to pick one though, because there's YouTube, there's TikTok, there's Twitter. You can't be everywhere all at once, but I think that we both agree that a welcoming community that allows us to, to synthesize and to bring together all of our diverse interests, whether they be technology or medicine or both is a great opportunity. Absolutely. And yeah, that, I love that last part you said synthesis, I think is like the mo one of the most important things I've learned in life, like the value of that, how important that is. And and yeah, one of the best things you can do is if you can provide synthesis for people so that they can do their own synthesis, I think it's like super cool. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Divya Dar Cohen, for chatting with me today. Thank you so much, Scott. Really um, loved being here. And thank you for taking the time to chat with me. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week.